Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. Last time we talked about bubble sort, a simple, comparison-based, stable algorithm which repeatedly steps through an unsorted list, compares adjacent elements, and swaps them if they are in the wrong order. I highly recommend you watch our episode on bubble sort before today's lecture, as our next algorithm builds off a lot of the information that's covered in that video. Now speaking of bubble sort, we mentioned that the bubble sorting algorithm is, well, extremely bad. The structure of the algorithm leaves a lot to be desired, and improvements can be made to enhance the efficiency of it quite easily. One of these ways we can enhance the algorithm is by converting it into a cocktail shaker sort, which, coincidentally, is the topic for today's video. Cocktail shaker sort, by definition, is a variation of bubble sort which traverses a list of elements both forwards and backwards as opposed to just forwards, and swaps values if needed. If we look at how bubble sort traverses through a list, you can see that it starts at the beginning and makes its way to the end before starting at the beginning yet again. In contrast, if we look at the way the cocktail shaker sort traverses through a list, you'll see it goes back and forth between the first and last element in the dataset, like a game of computer science ping pong. Apart from this minor difference, the algorithm performs in pretty much the same way. Speaking of that algorithm, let's take a look at the pseudocode for it. Step 1 for cocktail shaker sort is going to be exactly the same as step 1 was for bubble sort. We define two variables, a swapped values boolean and a traversing index integer. The swapped values boolean helps us determine when the list is sorted, and the traversing index helps us traverse through our list. We initialize these to true and zero respectively, which prepares them for the first pass through the list. Step two is to use a while statement to test that while swapped values is equal to true, we enter the following block of code, or in this case, pseudocode. On our first pass through the list, this is always going to end up evaluating to true, because as you can see, we literally just initialized swap values as true. In any case, we enter the block of code and move to step A. Step A has a set swapped values equal to false, which we do because during any one particular pass through our while loop, we start out having yet to swap any values within our list. Then, step B entails traversing from the zeroth index to the last index in the dataset. This is a loop, so we enter it accordingly and run step i. Step i asks us if the value of the integer stored at the traversing index is greater than the value of the integer stored at the traversing index plus 1. If so, we know that the two elements need to be swapped, since we're working towards a list that is sorted in ascending order. So, we swap the two, and set swapped values equal to true, as we have now swapped values in our list. Step 2 simply tells us to increase the traversing index, and that's all that's needed for the first traversing loop of our algorithm. Now notice how I say first traversing loop, because we actually have two in cocktail shaker sort. This is where the algorithm branches off from bubble sort. After the first traversing loop, which takes us from the zeroth index to the last index of our list, we will have a second traversing loop, which takes us from the last index of our list back down to the zeroth. The good part about this, and the reason that cocktail shaker sort is better than bubble sort, is that the traversing index is already at the last index from our first traversing loop. So all we need to do now is repeat the same steps for traversing down the list. First, however, for step C, we exit the loop if swapped values is equal to false. This is because if swapped values is equal to false, we know that the list is sorted and we can exit the algorithm. If not, however, we need to travel back down the list and swap additional values. So we set up a second loop, which traverses from the last index to the zeroth index. Then, we enter in step i, like from the first traversing loop. Only this time, we ask if the value stored at the traversing index is less than the value stored at the traversing index minus 1. This is simply the reverse of the statement from the first traversing loop. If it is, we swap the two values and set swapped values equal to true. If not, we do nothing. Then, finally, for step ii, 
we decrease the traversing index by 1. This is, again, the opposite of step ii from the first traversing loop, because remember, we now have to go back down the list instead of up it. After that, believe it or not, our code is complete. Once the code runs and we can traverse back and forth through our list without swapping any values, we know that the list is sorted and we can exit the algorithm. This is done, of course, using our swapped values boolean. If you remember, anytime we swap two values in our pseudocode, we set this boolean equal to true. And at the beginning of the pseudocode, we encased everything in a while statement, which only ran while that variable was equal to true. Well, once we go through the list without setting that variable equal to true by swapping values, we can be 100% sure that the list is sorted and exit the algorithm. Neat. To see this algorithm in action, let's pull up the same list of five elements that we had last time for the bubble sorting algorithm and run a cocktail shaker sort on it. So we start off with step one from our pseudocode, which is to initialize two variables, swapped values as true and traversing index as zero. Then we go on to step two, which is a while statement that checks while swapped values is equal to true. We literally just initialized swapped values as true, so of course we're going to enter the loop. The first thing we do is immediately set swapped values equal to false. Up next, we start from the zeroth index and traverse to the last index in the dataset, using our traversing index as a stepper. Then, if the value at the traversing index is greater than the value at the traversing index plus 1, which, if you look at our list, is the case since 10 is greater than 5, we swap the two values and set swapped values equal to true. The next step is to increase the traversing index by 1. Since we're still not at the last element of our list, we go back to step i and compare the value at the traversing index to the value at the traversing index plus 1. This entails comparing 10 to 7, and since 10 is greater than 7, again we swap the two values. We again increase the traversing index by 1, and since we're still not quite at this last index, we move back to step i again. Hopefully you're getting the gist of things by now, but we still have work to do. Next, we compare the value at the traversing index to traversing index plus 1, so 10 and 12. 10 is less than 12, and so we don't need to swap or set any values. We simply move on to step i i and increase the traversing index by 1. Here we are at the second to last index, so this will be our last comparison. We compare the integer at the third index, 12, to the integer at the fourth index, 2. Since 12 is greater than 2, we swap the two values. We increase the traversing index one more time, and as you can see, we've reached the end of our list. This concludes the end of our first traversing loop. The next thing we have to do is check if swapped values is equal to false. If it is, we know that our list is sorted and we can exit out of the algorithm. Unfortunately for us, this is not the case, however, and so we have to keep chugging along with our algorithm. That takes us to step D, which instructs us to traverse from the traversing index to the zeroth index in the dataset. Luckily for us, we're already at the last index, so we can move into the second loop immediately. Inside this loop, we are asked to now compare the integer stored at the traversing index to the one stored at the traversing index minus 1, and swap the two if need be. So we compare 12 to 2, and since 12 is greater than 2, we do not need to swap, and so we move on. The next step is to decrease our traversing index, which now makes it 3. Now, we just wash, rinse, and repeat steps i and ii. So we now compare the integer 2 with the integer 10. Now since 2 is less than 10, we swap the two values. We decrease the traversing index once more, making it 2. We compare 2 and 7, and since 2 is less than 7, we swap the two values once again. The list is looking in pretty good shape, but we still have some work to do. So we decrease the traversing index once again to make it 1. Since the traversing index is 1, we compare the integer at index location 1 to the integer at index location 0. In other words, we compare 2 and 5, 
and since 2 is less than 5, we swap the values. We decrease the traversing index, and since we are now at the 0th index in the list, we exit out of our second traversing loop. Now if you're paying close attention, the list is actually sorted at this point, after only one pass through the while loop. But again, after this point in our algorithm, we are taken all the way back to the first while loop, which asks us if swapped values is equal to true. Now if we looked at swapped values, this is true, since we did swap values on our last pass through the list. In fact, we swapped a lot of values, so we do have to go through the list forwards once more without swapping any values to prove to the algorithm that this list is indeed sorted. So we enter back through the loop. I think you guys get the idea, so let's speed things up. We traverse from the zeroth index to the last index, etc, etc. Basically, we end up comparing the elements in the list like so. 2 and 5, 5 and 7, 7 and 10, and 10 and 12. Then, we reach the end of the list, and so we reach the part of the algorithm which tells us to exit the loop if swapped values is equal to false. Now we haven't swapped any values in our list, so we can actually exit the loop and know that our list is completely sorted. And that's a cocktail shaker sort. Now that we've run through it, you can probably see how it's similar to bubble sort, and also how it's more efficient. However, that was a lot of words and information thrown at you, and it might not have made complete sense. So let's pull up the visualizer and run through what a cocktail shaker sort looks like in practice. Running it on a dataset with 30 elements gives you a pretty good idea of what's happening, so let's do that. You can see the traversing index going back and forth like a colorful game of ping pong as it cycles through the two traversing loops that we set up. You'll also notice that it gets faster and faster as the elements move up and down the list and gets closer to their respective spots. Let's run it again on a larger data set. And this time, notice how just like with bubble sort, you can see that the larger elements bubble to the top and the smaller elements sink down to the bottom. This is a trait commonly associated with exchange sorts. A large element at the bottom of the list is going to keep being larger than those above it, so it will bubble to the top. Vice versa, a small element at the top of the list is going to keep being smaller than those below it, causing it to sink to the bottom. Pretty cool. Again, we'll have a full video of visualizations coming out in the next few days, so be on the lookout for that if you enjoy these parts of the videos. Up next, however, we get to talk about my favorite segment, time and space complexity. The time and space complexity equations for a cocktail shaker sort are as follows. Its worst case scenario time complexity is O of n squared, its average case scenario is O of n squared, and its best case scenario is O of n. For space complexity, its worst case scenario equation is O of n. Now avid viewers may be looking at this and running to the comments, typing out something that sounds something like this. Hey Steven, you said this was better than bubble sort, but its time and space complexities are exactly the same. What gives? Well, before you hit send on that comment, let me explain. While the time complexity equations for both algorithms are the same, you have to remember that time complexity does not give you the full picture. On average, cocktail shaker sort performs faster than bubble sort. It just doesn't show you in the time complexity equations. Now the reasoning for the time complexity equations are mostly the same as they were for bubble sort. Its worst case and average case scenarios are both O of n squared, because again, we're still only ever swapping two elements at a time. This means for large data sets, it's going to take an extremely long time to get the list from an unsorted position to a sorted position. And again, its best case scenario is O of n, because if we're given an already sorted list, all we need to do is check if the list has been sorted by going through without swapping any values, and we can exit the program after the first traversing loop. So in a review, best case and average case time complexities are O of n squared, because the algorithm is still pretty terrible. Best case is O of n, considering the case we're handed a sorted list. And time complexity is O of 1, because obviously we create no extraneous memory to help sort this list. Now I'll repeat what I said a few moments ago. This algorithm is still pretty terrible. 
That, of course, is code word for this algorithm does not get implemented very often in real-world applications. Much like bubble sort, cocktail shaker sort is inefficient, leading to it not having much practical use. The algorithm is mainly used as an educational tool for new computer science students to help get them comfortable with topics surrounding sorting algorithms. There are extreme advantages to this, however, since it's best to introduce new concepts through examples which are as simple as possible to make sure you get the core knowledge before moving on to more complex examples. By learning bubble sort and now cocktail shaker sort, you should have a fairly good understanding of many important topics. These include pseudocode for sorting algorithms, time complexity equations, space complexity equations, stable sorting algorithms, and comparison-based algorithms. All of this will come in handy the further we traverse along our sorting algorithm journey. Not bad for a useless sorting algorithm. That also concludes our discussion on cocktail shaker sort. As a review, it is a stable variation of bubble sort, which traverses a list of elements both forwards and backwards as opposed to just forwards, and swaps values if needed. Again, if you're confused at all about any aspect of cocktail shaker sort, Check the description for timestamps, which will take you to each section of this video. With that being said, be on the lookout for the cocktail shaker sort visualization in the next few days, as well as another video from Sean continuing along his series remastering the Introduction to Programming lecture. Thanks for watching.